Good morning, First Alliance family. Welcome to our online worship gathering. We're so excited to still be able to worship the Lord together today, even though we're still practicing social distancing. I also want to welcome all of our online visitors. We're so glad that you've decided to join us for worship this morning. If you would like more information about our church and ministry, check out our website, firstalliancerlando.org, and follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, for daily devotionals, prayers, and updates about our ministry. I also want to invite everyone to make sure you stay to the end of our service this morning for a special announcement from Pastor Jesse and myself. Let's begin our time in worship together. Let's sing declaring the praises of our God and what he has done through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. James 4 tells us to draw close to God and he will draw close to us. That is a promise that we can hold on to this morning, that as we invite the Holy Spirit into our homes, let's ask him to do a deep work within us, transforming us more into his image and preparing us to be salt and light and love in the world around us. So let's join together in singing and worshiping our Lord.
brothers, for its friends, and even for its enemies. God, let us live like that. Let us love like that. For Jesus, we love you, and thank you for loving us first and showing us the way. We praise you. We love you. We thank you. And we need you. So come and fill us now. We ask all this in the mighty and powerful name of our Father, of your Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here at First Alliance. I am so glad and so happy that you were able to take your time and worship our Lord and Savior with us. Uh, today, we are going to finish up Matthew chapter 25. We have been looking at the parables of Jesus and about his return. We've talked about, about those servants that that were not using their time wisely in Matthew 24 and and the scripture tells us and focuses and Jesus is helping us understand that we need to use our time wisely. That each and every one of us have a certain amount and, and we don't know what that amount is because it's given to us by God. And to use it well. So when the Lord returns, he finds us doing his will. He also talked to us in Matthew 25 in the first part of the chapter, about the parable of the ten virgins. And the focus was being prepared. Make sure that you sit down and consider the cost. Make sure you have enough oil in your lamp to make it to the end. For when that trumpet sounds, you won't have time to prepare. So get prepared today. Jesus also talked to us in the parable of the talents and how to invest our life in the kingdom of God and how to invest wisely. But today he, he shifts gears in, in chapter 31 or verse 31 rather, he shifts gears and Jesus begins to talk not in a parable, but he begins to speak truth and he's foretelling his group, his audience, his congregation, his followers. He's talking to you and I as well about the end of all things. After he meets us in the air, after the millennium, after the tribulation, after all of those things, Jesus is going to come. And he is going to come with all his angels. And the scripture says that all the nations will be brought to him. And, and he is going to take all the people. And if you look at the, the, the wording in the passage, he says he's going to gather every single nation, but he's going to start dividing every person individually. That separation, that division, is going to be into one of two groups. He said, I'm going to put the sheep on my right hand, and I am going to put the goats on my left. Jesus is is referring to two groups of people. He's referring to those that are blessed of the Lord, the sheep, and the goats that are cursed, that, that have chosen not to live for God. You know, Scripture tells us that Jesus is going to come in all of His majesty and glory. And at that moment, 
uh, I know that, that there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be surprised because there's a lot around me today that I know of that think that Jesus was a good man but that he was a little off saying that he was the son of God. There are others that think that he was a lunatic, that he was crazy. And there's others that think he was a charlatan, that he was just pulling the wool over our eyes. And there are many people in our world today that look at Christians as being uh, simple-minded, and, and they cannot believe that we would actually put our faith and trust in the words of a man that lived 2,000 years ago. But my friends, I have good news for you. On that day, on that day, there is not one person in this world that will not know and will not understand that Jesus Christ is King of all kings and Lord of all lords. That he will sit on the throne as the great judge of all the earth. They're not going to know him as just a man, but they're going to know him as he, as he truly is, God incarnate. They're going to see him in his majesty and in his glory and in his splendor. The reason why Jesus gave us the parables to, to invest our time wisely and to, and to prepare our hearts and to make sure that we're ready for him. Because when it gets to this point, there is no more changing. What you are is what you are. Who you are is who you are. What you have done and how you have lived will determine where you spend eternity. My friends, I, I come to you today with a heart full of joy and at the same time with a, with a burden in my spirit because I want to see God's people rise to the challenge of the day. I want to see God's people look at, at Him for who He truly is. And let's be about the Father's business we, we cannot afford to allow uh, our, our life to be filled with the things of this world that focus our attention on the temporal. We need to be uh, a focus, or rather have a focus on the eternal to be about our Father's business. My friends, there's a great blessing. There's a great blessing awaiting each and every one of us that have a passion and a desire to follow after Him. Jesus said it this way. He said, he said to those sheep, those that were on his right hand, those that are on a, pray, uh, a place of authority and, and blessing, he said, enter into my kingdom and, and enter in to eternal life. I want you to note that there is a kingdom to come. That I don't know what you think about eternity, but I can guarantee you this. You're not just going to sit around on a, on a cloud and play a harp. There is a kingdom that will be established and that is going to reign and rule forever. And Christ will always sit on the throne of that kingdom. That we have a place in that kingdom. That he has things for us to do. And throughout eternity, we will live, we will work, we will enjoy one another. We will have fellowship with not only with one another, but with Christ himself. What a day that's going to be. What a joyous time for those that are called blessed of the Lord. My friends, make sure that you're using your time wisely. Make sure that you're investing in the kingdom of God. Make sure that you're prepared because at that time, there will not be an opportunity to change. Jesus said that all the nations will be gathered. I believe and this is my own theology, and uh, you can disagree and be wrong if you want. Uh, but I believe he's bringing all of his angels because he's gathering everybody. I looked at that passage of scripture, and when he talks about us being gathered, he's talking about it in a passive sense. In other words, you have no choice. You will be gathered together. Have you ever been pushed or placed in a position or, or a situation uh, that you did not want to be in, but you had no choice? This is one of those times that doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you've been born, it doesn't matter what your status in life is, everybody will be forced to be there. And Jesus himself will be doing the separating. 
You know, and I look at sometimes in church life, look, can we, can we be honest with, with one another? I've met a lot of people that profess Christianity. I've seen a lot of people that say, I'm a Christian, and, and I believe that they're a Christian, but I am not the real judge, nor are you. The only one that really knows is Jesus Christ. And he is the one that's going to do the separating. So the scripture tells us that Jesus separates them and, and he separates them and, and he tells those that are blessed. He said, you're blessed because when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. And when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you took me in. You brought me into your own home. And when, and when I was sick or in prison, you came to visit me. Notice that everything he talks about here are basic human needs of shelter and companionship and food and clothing. It's, it's the essential things of life. I find it interesting that he, he says the same thing to those that, that were cursed, those that, that didn't do anything. See, their sin of omission cost them. It's not just the things we do, but it's the things we don't do have an impact in our life. So he, he told them, he said, for when I was hungry, you didn't do anything. And, and when I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink. And, they, and I find it interesting that the blessed and the cursed both had the same response. They said, Lord, when did we see you? I find it fascinating that both those that were blessed and those that were cursed did or did not do things in their life based on the fact that neither one of them saw Christ in it. You know what that tells me? Jesus is not looking at us and saying, guys, you have to earn your salvation. Ephesians 2.8 tells us that we are saved by grace through faith. And that's not even of ourselves. It's, it's, the, it's a gift of God. It's, it's that faith in him. But what Jesus is, is hinting at, what Jesus is getting to, what Jesus is trying to help us understand is what the writers of the New Testament continually focus on and, and, and try to get into our minds and our hearts is simply this, that there has to be a transformation of the heart and the spirit, that a follower of Christ, a, a, a devoted passionate follower of Jesus Christ will change, that they will have a transformation. Their mindset will change. Their heart will change. And what Jesus is saying is simply this. When that change occurs, how you perceive people will change. My friends, when that's always been the case. When you look back in the Old Testament and God gave the Ten Commandments, do you realize that four were about his, your relationship with you and God? Six were about your relationship with your fellow man. Jesus is trying to help us understand that real transformation, real relationship with him will change the way you think about humanity, that you will have compassion, that you will have understanding, that you'll walk an extra mile, that you'll give them your cloak, that you will turn the other cheek because your greatest desire is the same desire that Christ had, that he saw humanity lost and without hope. And he came. Paul described it beautifully in Philippians 2. And he said, he who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. My friends, we need to understand that becoming a passionate follower of Jesus Christ is not just getting a get out of hell free card and saying, Jesus, you can follow me wherever I go. It's about devoting your life and your life's call to him. 
It's about allowing the spirit of the living God to transform you on the inside, that you begin to see people in a different light, that you see them as Christ sees them, as sheep without a shepherd, as lost souls that are heading for a devil's hell. My friends, the passage of Scripture that we're looking at, that we're reading, the cursed, or the, Jesus says that they are going to a place prepared for the devil and his angels. See, he's not, he didn't originally design it for them. But they chose to follow their own course. They chose to follow the adversary. They chose not to surrender their heart and life and allow God to transform them. And as a result, they will spend eternity in torment. My friend, I, I have a heart today that is full and, and it, it's compelling me. It's urging me to remind you and to remind myself that there is nothing in this life that is worth losing your soul. There is nothing in this life that is worth spending eternity apart from God. My friends, He has a great plan for us. He has a great treasure. He has a great kingdom. We have eternal life awaiting us. Spend your time wisely. Be prepared. Invest in the kingdom of God. But my friends, when Jesus comes, those sheep were chosen not because they sat back and said, you know, I think I'll give this person uh, a meal because it will be good in my portfolio, in my spiritual portfolio. Because I, 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 I know that Jesus would love that. See, they weren't earning their way into heaven. They were doing these things because they were saved and the transformation took place in their life. How do you see people? How do you see those that are lost around you? We were in, in France, and I've told this story before, but we were in France in, in the metro, in the subway, and, and in France, they said, that, you know, basically it's four-tenths of one percent or, or, or six-tenths of one percent are Christian. And, and there were six of us standing there, my wife and I and, and two other couples, and, and I, I told them, I said, you know, if, if the statistics are true, then... The six of us, if the Lord would come back, the six of us are going to make it. But that 250 that are sitting, are standing next to us, they're not going to make it. And that other 250 on the other side aren't going to make it. And the 500 that are in the car, they're not going to make it. And it was overwhelming. When you look at it and see humanity lost and without hope. My friends, a transformation can occur in our lives that we don't do good things to earn salvation, but we're doing them because we have the same love for people that God does. For John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. I wonder if, if we could honestly say that we put our name in there. For John so loved the world, for Susie so loved the world, for Jesse so loved the world that he gave, that she gave her life for others. My friends, there is no other way. Trust in Him. Believe in Him. Devote your life to Him and allow the Spirit to renew a right spirit in you. And when He returns, you will hear the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Would you pray with me? 
Father, we thank you today. And I pray right now that if there's anyone that's listening today that, that doesn't know you, that doesn't have their heart right, or perhaps they've been living in a, in a lifestyle that is not pleasing to you, that I, I pray right now in your name that you would challenge them to lay it down, that they would passionately follow you. But Lord, I know that today is the day of salvation, but there is coming a day when there will be no more opportunity. So may we take this opportunity today to draw closer to you. Bless those that are hearing this. May we be transformed. And may that transformation give us an undying devotion to you and to humanity. May we serve you and serve humanity faithfully until your return. Bless this day, we pray in Jesus' name. God bless you, my friends. I hope you have a fantastic week. Can't wait to be able to worship together in person. God bless. Jesus satisfies 
Thank you again for joining us this morning. We hope that you were blessed by what you heard and our time of worship together. And now we have some very special news for all of you. Hey guys, mark your calendars. May 31st is the day that we are going to come back together as a church to have a live worship service right here at First Alliance. Man, I can't hardly wait. Uh, I know it's going to look a little different. So Sam, uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of the changes that are going to be? Yes. When we come back together, it's going to be an exciting time, but we are still going to be practicing social distancing here within our service. And that's going to require many guidelines and instructions that we are going to be sending out to all of you via, our, via social media, through email. So make sure you subscribe to our weekly email. We're going to be sending all of that information out to you over the next two weeks. But we're so excited that we're all going to be together as a church family again in person to worship together. So I can't hardly wait. I know there's a lot of you that are really anxiously looking forward to this day. So May 31st, mark your tech calendars and we look forward to seeing you in person. Have a blessed week. God bless you.